Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is Saurav Sharma. I'm currently a senior product manager at Amazon. And I'm excited to talk today about finding product market fit. Without further ado, uh, let's get just get started. Yeah, um, yeah, just a little bit about my background. Um, as I said, I'm currently a senior product manager at Amazon. Um, before Amazon, I worked in uh, eBay in the San Francisco Bay Area. I uh, also worked as a product lead at uh, Sarah Monkey. Um, uh, prior to product management, I've also done uh, kind of business consulting with TCS, with leading clients like GE Capital, GE Healthcare, and Charles Schwab. Um, did my MBA from Boot School of Business in Chicago. Um, uh, kind of kind of fun fact about me. And so far, I've like worked in about three continents, India, Bangalore, um, US, Stanford, and San Francisco, uh, and now Canada, Toronto. Yeah, um, that's just a brief overview about me. Uh, and now let's get started. Um, here's uh, here's our agenda for today. Uh, and we'll try to uh, kind of um, uh, mostly stick to it. Uh, but, you know, we're going to talk about uh, products of product market fit, take some company examples, uh, product market fit framework, um, and then talk about, you know, how do you know that you probably achieve product market fit or not? And then also talk about some common misconceptions and then finally you can prove. Okay, uh, let's just. Okay, um, there's like many different definitions of what product market fit is. Um, and there is like um, um, you know, different ways you can describe it, but like uh, the way I like to kind of describe about it is, you know, just putting very simplistic terms, um, like your, your product that you see here, which is composed of your UX feature set and value proposition that kind of meets uh, the market in terms of underserved needs and the target customer. That's uh, you know simplistic definition of you know what a product market fit is, and you know you can think of it like you know in in, in different ways. But like the two of the ones that I kind of like, uh, you know, I've kind of mentioned it here. Uh, one, the first one is from Mark Anderson. You know, it's it's all about putting a product that satisfies the market need, right? That that is just like the very <laughs> uh, basic one, um, you know. And but this is very powerful, right? I mean, like th that's all to it, right? I mean, and you can put different spins around it, but that's kind of like the crux of it. Uh, another one that I like is, you know, for this is from Elizabeth Yun, um, that you find a product market fit when you can repeatedly acquire customers for a lower cost than they are worth to you. Basically, what that means is that if if, if the amount of value that the customer is giving you is more than uh what you spend on acquiring them you know that that's when you know you have achieved kind of like the product market fit um that's just like you know starting it and we're gonna uh dig deeper into it in our subsequent slides okay um let's look at um you know you might be wondering like why all this fuzz about product market fit right um this is actually a very, um, you know, like important thing. Uh, and this is especially true for, you know, the zero to one kind of products, which are like new products that the companies launch. Um, and there is some stat, uh, you know, it says that about 42% uh, of startups fail because no one wants to buy their product. And this is like pretty startling. And also for corporations, like about 80% of the new products fail each year, right? So that's a pretty uh, daunting stat. Uh, to have to say like um, you know why you know this product market fit is important. Um, also, you know if you think about it, this is scary as real because companies are spending like millions of dollars annually to chase it, uh, and then realize that you know it's it's not there, or only like few of the products might you know achieve it from some of the companies, right? So I mean, if you think of the analogy to like the use is like. Uh, it's like a mirage, right? The more you chase and force fit, the more it goes away from it, from you, right? <laughs> so um, that's just uh, you know the how the nature of the beast is. Okay, um, 
yeah, let's just um, look through some examples now, as I, I would have said, um, to see like, you know, what it means. So just I've taken some examples of companies that have achieved uh, product market fit. And, and I just say it as of today is because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But like as of today, uh, we know that these companies have product market fit, right? Um, and there's we're going to see in a while that, you know, the product market fit is not a like a one time thing that you achieve. And then, you know, you can say like, hey, I, I achieved it. Now I'm going to keep it for the rest of my life. Yeah, it doesn't just work that way. Right? I mean, there's a, like a continuous process. Uh, companies need to be aware of and keep working towards to make sure that they uh, their products remain product market fit and, you know, don't like drop off. Um, okay. Um, yeah, now I think the, the, the one which uh, I like about Uber is like, you know, just to give an example of, you know, what their timeline looked like uh, from product market fit perspective, right? So Uber launched, as you might know, that, you know, as a luxury ride hailing service in San Francisco in 2010, right? It was just like for the few elite group of people, it was just a ride hailing service that it launched, right? It's, it was very different from what you guys see today. Um, and, and there's a funny story. I remember that during uh, when I was in Bay Area, um, you know, like the way I discovered Uber was, you know, I was not able to find any cabs in the downtown area. And then I find it, you know, somebody told me that, hey, why didn't you try this Uber app? You know, that's you can just hail that, you know, cab from your phone. And, and that was like pretty exciting <laughs> uh, news. Uh, but anyways, like th that's just how I kind of like discovered it. Um, yeah, so in 2010, it launched in SFO. In 2011, um, then it slowly started expanding to other US cities uh, and started with a mobile app. You know, this is the first time they, you know, kind of had it. And that's when I also kind of like discovered it. Um, then companies, you know, like after a while when, when they launched, they started having this, you know, driver availability and reliability issues. And then they invested heavily to solve for it. And it took them some time, about two years uh, to kind of, kind of work through that and solve those uh, issues that they had. Um, and then finally in 2013 is when the company, uh, you know, launched at UberX and started the sharing economy model that we you know we are pretty well versed with now. Um, it's, it's like you have a car, you can, you know, start driving with Uber, right? I mean, but that didn't used to be the case when it started out, right? It slowly kind of evolved into that model. Um, by 2014, then, you know, like then Uber expanded to more than 100 global cities. Uh, and then once it, you know, their core product, which was ride hailing service that acquired, uh, you know, achieved like a good product market fit, then they slowly started expanding into other uh, product areas like the food delivery, you know, the Uber Eats that you see today or, or the free transportation, uh, you know. So those other product uh, areas those evolved over time, but you know, like the, their core one uh, was firstly the the Uber, the the, the cab hailing service, right? Uh, so that was their main. So as you can see here, that you know, like achieving product market fit and then expanding into other product uh, lines, it, you know, kind of like takes time. It's 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 a slow process. It's an iterative process, and it takes uh, a lot of time and effort to kind of like go through that and then you know start your other product lines, right? That's the point that I wanted to kind of make that, you know, uh, like how it kind of evolves over time. Um, yeah, now, you know, you might be aware of, you know, there's some companies that uh, lost product market fit, right? And and that's, again, I put like over time uh, because you know, it, it's not always like, you know, like do you have it today and tomorrow you, lo you lose it. Like it, it takes some time before you realize that, you know, that, that, thing is not there. Um, you might have seen, you know, BlackBerry or use BlackBerry phones with their QWERTY keyboard. It was like, you know, secure email service. It was like, you know, the revolutionizing mobile phones, right? Till the time Apple came along and with their touchscreen smartphones and apps, app stores and all, uh, then, you know, like customer behavior and habits started changing, right? And, and BlackBerry didn't quite evolve as per the, the needs. And finally, you know, although there might be few BlackBerry phones out there, but there's like a whole, a whole lot of uh, Apple phones, right? And Samsung phones and other smartphones, right? Um, yeah, same thing with Blockbuster, right? Blockbuster thought that, you know, renting via physical stores is the way to go about it. 
um, you know, customers like you know like doing it and coming to the store, buy, you know, get renting the DVDs, and then returning it back. Uh, well, yeah, that was true for some period in time uh, when Blockbuster you know expanded toward the US, but then it, you know came along Netflix and they put you know the entire thing over over the internet, right? I mean, you can just like stream movies and watch it, right? So, and slowly customer habits started changing and. You know, today we know that there might be only a handful of blockbuster stores or maybe left out there. And Netflix has like has become the number one uh, streaming service, right? Uh, or you know, maybe like there are a couple of them right now. There's Prime Videos as well, <laughs> uh, but um, the Netflix and Prime Videos are both like, like pretty strong services, you know, which are going on. Um, same story with Sears, right? I mean, brick and mortar was used to be a great business model, and Sears was like having tremendous customer loyalty and everything. Till the time they, you know, didn't pay heed to customer changing habits about, you know, like just ordering on phone and you know things arriving into their uh, houses, like the e the whole e-commerce phenomenon. Like Sears kind of missed that board. Um, they stuck to their, you know, traditional brick and store model. Um, maybe they did some things over, over the, how to do the, you know, the, the whole e-commerce thing, but they weren't like that innovative. And so, you know, other companies, you know, kind of just like Amazon and maybe others too, you know, kind of like overtook them, right? And now um, there might be only a handful of Sears stores out there as well. So that's just to kind of like give you a flavor of you know you know what happens um, and you know how companies kind of like lose the, this drug market fit over time. Okay, um, um, let's look at some of the common uh, misconceptions you know about product market fit, right? Um, and I've kind of seen that over the course of my um, experience of you know what happens and you know, you know sometimes you know we get excited about like what's happening. Um, so some of the misconceptions, like, you know, you get few better customers for your product, uh, you know, and then we start like, okay, great. We have product market fit. Or you get some rare reviews from one of your clients or customers, maybe a couple of them. And then you start like immediately like, okay, maybe we have a product market fit. And same thing with like, so like 3 PM versions of your product or customers are discovering product on their own. Um, and you know, like, we had like an excellent webinar showing the benefits of our product and you know many leaders signed up for it oh great you know we have product market fit well um these might be you know all these uh i, I would say is like you know they are like they are good starts towards achieving product market fit but not ex actually a product market fit right so we just we should you know just not like take things on base value um we need to like kind of like dig deeper to understand you know what product market fit is Okay. Um, um, like the frame. So I think let's talk about you know the framework for product market fit. I mean, uh, you know the framework is pretty like would say like if you are been in product management or you know you've been working or if you're starting new, might have heard about these things. But it's so it's pretty like uh, I would say standard. But you know the the way is like or you know the way it becomes challenging is like when you actually dig deeper into each of these areas and try to find more deep you know more uh what do you call it, nuances to it that that's where it you know challenge comes right um at a like a very um i would say simplistic the you know framework would be like defining your target customer finding the underserved needs of the customer um you know finding your value proposition for your product um specifying your mvp uh, with key features that you want to build, um, then finally building your MVP, then testing your MVP with the actual customers uh, before scaling, and then you know finally if everything goes good, then you you know end up scaling your product, and that's how it goes, right? So that's the kind of like the generic framework. Uh, but like key thing uh, to note and keep in mind is that this is not a, like a linear thing, right? I mean, so there could be um like back and forth building stages right so you might like start with you know some you know you have hypothesis you start with the, your target customers and then you thought like you know something was a good value proposition but when you start building your mvp or when you do some research you figure out that oh well, well that was not the case right so then you go back to your drawing board um sometimes it can happen even after you have kind of like you know you build your mvp and then you're testing the actual customers that's when you realize that you know it's not like working out right 
it's an expensive uh, thing after you build your MVP, but still, like you know, it's better than uh, launching something which the customers don't like and wasting your time and effort into it, right? Versus going back and figuring out, you know, like why did it work out and you know what could what we could have done differently, right? So it, it is an iterative process. It's definitely not a linear one. So that's something you know to definitely do kind of like keep in mind. Um, yeah. Um, also, uh, I think one of the important things I would uh, mention uh, is that um, you know since of the product market fit, when you're finding your underserved underserved needs of the customer, you know we talk about the market, right? Um, so you know, like in, in, when you're doing this calculation, you might have like heard or, you know, you might have seen, you know, we talk about three main terms, like right? the TAM, SAM and so, right? Um, so the key thing to keep in mind is when you're finding those underserved needs uh, for the customers in the market, right? Um, that you're looking for a market uh, that is, you know, uh, that is large enough and would be able to sustain your business, right? So that is like one of the key things that you should keep in mind. Um, so, and it's worthwhile to kind of research till the time, you know, you kind of like get there. Um, and in terms of, you know, when you look at it, um, you know, like many people would get stuck with like, okay, we have this total addressable market, right? Um, you know, that is big and let's get, get to it. But I think the key thing to keep in mind is that you're looking for your SOM, uh, not your TAM, right? Uh, because TAM is the total addressable market for whatever industry and product that you're launching, right? That doesn't mean that you'll be able to capture it. You, you like in very unlikely case, if you have a monopoly or something, you know, you might be able to, but that's very rare. Most of the cases, there will be a lot of other people competing for the same uh, TAM, uh, right? And then you have to find your what's your unique value proposition and how much you'll be able to capture, right? So, you know, like, the, the one you should focus on is your SOM, right? And not like your TAM. Um, just, I wanted to kind of like highlight that point. Um, okay, now we come back uh, to the main question, like uh, how do we know like, did my product achieve product market fit or not, right? Um, so I'll, I'll say that, you know, there is like, you know, there's not no single metric that will tell you about product market fit, right? Usually it's a combination of both qualitative and quantitative uh, metrics. And also like finding product market fit requires long-term thinking on part of companies and its leaders and it's just, not just to try out uh, for a few months, right? It's not like you try something out for a few months and then say like, oh, well, we didn't achieve product market fit, you know, sorry, uh, let's not <laughs> try it and and then you know just stick to whatever we have been doing in the past and what has worked right i mean that's not how you're gonna achieve your product market fit it requires some consistent efforts over a long period of time for you to kind of see the fruits of your uh you know the hard work that you put in um few things uh, you know in terms of qualitative side you can look you know look at around the word of mouth from customers you know calls about your products from news and media agencies on the quantitative side you know you have uh, like NPS score, growth rate, market share uh, for your product, like, you know, where you're operating on, um, how fast is your, um, like, product growing, uh, you know, what's the growth rate compared to the market, like, you know, market is growing at a certain stage, you know, is your product growing at a faster rate than the market, um, you know, like, customer lifetime value, you know, you know, is, is your lifetime value more than the customer acquisition cost, right, that that's, and then how it is growing, um, and then how is your retention, like churn rate and uh, other things then you can, you know, you can look at, um, you know, the point being like, yes, there are like a lot of these metrics and all we can look at, but usually it's not just one thing, you know, which can tell you that it's like usually a combination. Uh, and we're going to see some of those in the next slide. Um, yeah, so, okay, so now, as, as I was saying, like some of the signs, right? Like when you have a product, how can you tell that you know you have achieved product market fit, right? The one is your exponential organic growth, right? Um, that's very important, right? Because you don't want always to be uh, putting money um, in for your ads and then, you know, kind of like getting customers in, right? You If you, if you have achieved a certain um, level uh, of um, 
uh, your product has reached a certain level, you want to be uh, then shifting towards you know your organic growth, right? You don't want always to be relying on ads to to grow your business, or you know uh, you have to uh, eventually reduce the ad spend and then you know focus more on organic growth as well. Um, user retention, as I was saying, you know if you're having a very high user retention. Typically, you know, uh, at least forty percent is considered a go good one for product market fit, and you have a strong sign uh, that you know you're moving in the right direction towards uh, PMF. Um, as like compared to um, you know lifetime value and customer acquisition cost, so if you um, you know like if you're spending like say one dollar to acquire a customer with lifetime value of three, you know that is typically you know the you know the tax. It's a good number to have in terms of like. You know, signs for a product market fit, right? So that's like a three to one return on customer acquisition cost, right? So that's uh, another thing uh, which are like good signs that your product is in a product market fit uh, stage. Um, yeah, I mean, if your customers are pretty disappointed, that your product is removed from the market, and you know, a good number is about forty percent, uh, then you know, uh, then it's a uh, then it's a like a you know sign that you you are you know. Yeah, your product had uh, you know product market fit if that this were to happen um and, you know the other one i would consider is like something like customers are clamoring for a product right i mean so like you know they are buying your product as fast as you can make it or in you know like in, in other cases you know they are using it or you know they're using it as fast as you can add your servers right and your capacity for them to make more users use your product right so that's just uh, another kind of like analogy that i can use um you know like it's on the qualitative side but like if we want to talk to you about a hot new product that you have built right i mean it's all over the news and agencies right so these are like some of the signs that you can consider that you you know you uh your product is actually achieving product market fit, right? So these are, you know, some of the signs to kind of look for, um, right? And you know, like this graph that, that I put here that explains it perfectly, you know, like, you know, what what it means uh, to have a product market fit, right? Uh, and like it's a two by two, but, you know, it kind of gives a good uh, feel for it. Okay. Um, okay, uh, conclusion, right? So this is what I wanted, you know, to say is that here, like achieving product market is not a one-time event, right? So if you think that it's a one-time event, that's definitely not the case, right? It's an ongoing process and companies must be willing to continuously iterate and improve their products, right? That That is just like given, right? It's it's not like, you know, I can, I've launched a product, it's a cheap product market fit, and then I can just sit tight and then forget about it. No, that definitely doesn't happen, you know? Product market fit could be lost due to, you know, uh, changing market conditions or, um, you know, changing customer needs or, you know, innovation that is happening in the market or failure to scale your product, right, for the customer. It can happen for a lot of these re reasons. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind. And then the other thing is, you know, because of, you know, that the fact that PMF can be lost, that, you know, then the, this involves regularly testing new features, analyzing user behavior and making data-driven decisions to optimize the product for the target market, right? So this is like, uh, it's an ongoing thing, that's why, right? I mean, you can't get you know, leave your foot off the paddle, right? I mean, you have to continuously evolve your product, uh, keep iterating and trying and innovating uh, for it to stay in that product market fit phase, right? Uh, okay, um, that's about it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, for being here. Uh, until next time, see you in another product webinar. Take care. Have a good night.